First up, we have Silvio Dallavalle. It's me. Yes, <laughs> it's me. Silvio is a lawyer by profession. He offers legal, strategic, and copyright consultations for faith, life, and family organizations in the USA, Italy, and throughout European countries. He has many, many involvements. Today he's going to speak to us on the key role of the family and civil society in the transmission of faith. Let's welcome Sylvia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And a very good afternoon and a very warm welcome to all of you to this section of Faith, Family and Society. Do you hear me? Yes. I'm very happy and honored to be here in this wonderful and beautiful state of Utah. I'm also very happy to meet great people, people of faith like you all. I will start my brief presentation with a true story which happened not long time ago. Soon after the Bolshevik Revolution, one of the worst religious persecutions the world has ever known started all over the former uh, Soviet Empire. People of, of faith were killed or imprisoned, most churches were closed, some of them destroyed, other turned to profane use. The situation lasted for over 75 years. Do you understand me, my English? Okay. <laughs> that was my concern. In the early 90s of the last century, soon after the fall of communism, uh, many churches were constructed or restored to their original purposes, all in the Soviet Union. The first masses and the religious re uh, celebrations were held in public square in the middle of winter, sometimes under heavy snow. In one city in the countryside of Belarus, a country that was once a part of the Soviet Empire, in a city with a Catholic, a Catholic majority, the old church, a beautiful old red brick church, had been destroyed during the times of persecution, and a new one was about to be built. Then, an impressive uh, thing happened. Many local people whose families were victims of the persecution started taking back to the construction site of the new church some old red bricks they had kept at their homes. Mm. Where had those old red bricks come from? Those red bricks belonged to the old church that, has, that had been blown up more than 70 years ago or earlier. The locals gathered those red bricks, scattered, scattered about, took them home, and started praying before then, all the family together, throughout the time of persecution, during 75 years, always in a hidden way, with their windows closed. They prayed in front of those bricks as if they still were their church. Those old bricks remind them of their old place of worship that had been destroyed. And those red bricks were passed from one generation to the next. Always in a hidden way, they baptized their children, celebrated Christmas, Eastern, and other religious feasts. When communism fall, fell, uh, we discovered that the faith in the Soviet Union had been kept and it was still very alive. The faith had been passed from one generation to the next within the family, not in society, not in church. <clears throat> Only the institution of the family had remained. What's my point in telling you this true story? My point is to stress the key importance of the institution of the family in passing on the faith from one generation to the, to the next. Without the institution of the family, the faith would have disappeared in the former Soviet Union. Christians had no civil society to rely upon. They had no church to rely upon. The only thing they had, the only thing that remained was the institution of the family. 
This shows how the institution of the family is an important or may be an, uh, play an important role or may be it's more important than society to pass on and keep the faith. And from, uh, and from some standpoint of view, it's even more important than the church as an institution. Because it is in the family that young children acquire the first notion of faith. That's why parents have a fundamental and primary responsibility to educate and pass the faith to their children. It's their duty to create a family atmosphere inspired by love and devotion to God. Family is where children learn to place God first. Parents transmit that transmits their faith by living accordingly to their religious principles. When children perceive, for instance, Christian, Christian life or religious life through their parents' words and behavior, they gradually learn to follow their example and are oriented towards religious values. That's why the Catholic Church says that the family is a domestic church. That's where children learn to see God as a father and Mary as their mother. That's where they learn to pray following their parents' example. In this way, we can easily see what a wonderful apostolate parents can do and how it's, it's their duty to live a fully religious life of prayer so they can communicate the, the, their love to God, of God to their children which is sometimes more than just teaching them. And by doing so, their children do not look for God at God as a stranger we get to see only once a week on church on Sundays. Uh, the three most important places to pass on and keep the faith probably are the family, society, and the church, in that order probably. In this brief presentation, I'm not going to talk about the importance of the church, which is self-evident. I've already talked a little bit about family. Now let's talk a little bit about civil society. <clears throat> Why civil society? Why society is also, from several standpoints, even more important than the church to pass on and keep the faith? Most religious people uh, most of us go to church and <coughs> worship just once a week. The rest of our time, the bulk of our time, we spend in family and in civil society, not in the church. We go to schools, work in offices, walk our streets, drive cars, take public transportation, go to restaurants, gyms, stadiums, theaters, and so on. That's our daily life. If we spend most of our time in places where we are not allowed to talk about God, in places where we don't, we, don't, we don't see things that remind us about God, if we don't see religious symbols, if God is out of schools, out of the workplace, what's going to happen? We simply forget about God, and so we tend to lose also our faith, little by little. And this is especially true with the younger generation. For instance, it happens to all of us. If we don't visit our loved ones very often, if we don't call them, if we don't care for them, we tend to forget them. The same thing happens with our relationship with God. Parents can certainly teach children how to pray and to fear God. But if it's in society, God is a stranger. If it's in society, we never talk about God or religion. If we don't express our faith in public, little by little, as I said, we first forgot, then we lose the faith. That's why our opponents don't want us to express our faith in public. Our secular establishment wants to reduce the autonomy of religious institutions and to limit the influence of faith in public square. They say that faith is a private matter. They, they say that religion has to be left out of society, out of public spaces. That's because they know that a faith which is not expressed publicly is a faith that tends to die. If you permit me to repeat this concept because I think it's very important. Our opponents know that a faith 
which is not expressed publicly is a faith that tends to die. As I said before, if you stop the praying in our schools, if you can no longer talk about God in public spaces, our faith will disappear little by little. That's what the communists tried to do, and they almost succeeded, had not been for the institutional family. That's why we have an obligation to bring our faith to the public sphere. We have a duty to stand up for our faith. Faith cannot be, cannot be marginalized and pushed out of public space. Our Lord expects us to, conf to confess our faith publicly, all the time with all our hearts. He that shall deny me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. And also, he that shall be ashamed of me, of him, the Son of Man shall be ashamed when he shall come in his majesty and that of his Father and of the holy angels. First, we stand up for our faith with our example, by living like true Christians. I know many people, and probably all you do too, many people who either return to the faith or discover the faith through the testimony or example or a friend or a co-worker. In my experience, many more people were discovered the faith through the, the, the testimony of a friend than through a beautiful Christian sermon. I do apologize if I'm offending the priest here present. <laughs> but that's the way I see it. And second, of course, we stand up for our faith with our deeds and actions, as we are doing right now here by fighting for natural family and for our, our Christian principles at the World Congress of Family. The faith that does not lead to actions and deeds is, a, is not a sincere faith. And I finish here with a quote from the prophet Jeremiah. Be conscious of God and always speak the truth. And if I may add, in public spaces as well. He teaches on the links between religion and family life. He has many academic qualifications from BYU and the University of Minnesota and has published many articles, many, many. He is here to speak to us today about religion and family life. Thank you, David. Well, it's great to be with you. I, uh, I uh, really appreciate Sylvia's uh, story about the the broken red bricks. In my office at BYU, I have uh, objects of uh, various from various religions. I have Catholic rosaries and Orthodox Christian icons and Jewish menorahs and a variety of other things. I teach a class on the family and world religions. And I think I'm going to go find a little piece of broken red brick and add it to my. Uh, I don't think I'll ever look at a red brick again. I think I can get some for you. Um, so I'm going to speak with you about a project that Lauren Marks, a uh, former student at BYU and, and then a professor at Louisiana State. Can you hear me okay? A uh, former professor at uh, Louisiana State and now a brand new uh, faculty member at BYU. A project that he and I have been doing for about 15 years on uh, what we call the American Families of Faith Project. So. Um, we have uh, interviewed a number of families from all across the country. I'll get into the details of that in, in a little while. And uh, it's been one of the great uh, blessings of my life, and I know Lauren would say the same thing, to have the chance to sit in the homes and, uh, and sometimes places of worship of wonderful families of many faiths, from many ethnicities, from many parts of this country, and hear them speak uh, about the two things that they love more than anything, their faith and their family, and the connections between them. So I'll just share with you a little bit about what we've learned from that. Uh, the website uh, that I'll point you to is called AmericanFamiliesOfFaith.byu.edu. There we have uh, PDFs of about 50 publications that we've done, as well as some other information. 
The mission of the project is to explore the nexus or the connections of religion and family relationships in order to discover and share ways of being religious that facilitate human joy as well as relational quality and stability. <coughs> what we've been doing the last 14 years is doing uh, very in-depth interviews, uh, several hours in most cases, uh, interviews with um, families from a variety of faith communities, including about a quarter of those uh, with uh, adolescent children in those families as well. About 500 total individuals, about 80, 80 of those were adolescents. Uh, we did in-depth interviews, so we have about 4,300 pages of transcripts, and we've gone into those transcripts with a, a variety of about 110 students, uh, both from BYU and from Louisiana State, uh, to look at a variety of kinds of questions about marriage, parenting, uh, youth religious development, and, and family processes. As I mentioned, we've published a number of things, and those are all available uh, for you if you're, if you're interested. And if any of you are interested, feel free to email me at david underscore dollahite at byu.edu, and I'll be happy to send you these slides so that you can, the links to the articles are right on here, so you don't need to worry about them. <coughs> there's a lot of studies in the social sciences uh, that look at religion and family, and overwhelmingly the data show that family and religion are connected. And for the most part, religion tends to have a very positive impact on marriage and family life. What we don't know as much about yet, because most of those studies have been quantitative, large sample studies using statistical analyses, but they, they don't go very deep into some of the questions of how and why. So that's what we do, is look at how faith works in families and why religion matters to families. We felt we needed to interview folks who were um, actively involved in their faith, so we, we asked pastors to uh, tell us about folk, you know, pastors, rabbis, priests, imams, bishops, and so forth, uh, to recommend families in their communities and their faith communities that were highly involved. Uh, the 200 families include 150 Christian families from a variety of denominations. You can see uh, some of them listed there. Uh, 30 Jewish families from the three major branches of Judaism, conservative, reform, and orthodox and 20 Muslim families uh, from both of the major branches of Islam, uh, Shia, and Sunni. Uh, the family, uh, excuse me, the sample is very diverse. Over half of the families were from a variety of ethnic uh, minorities. Uh, I've listed those uh, on there. And a number were immigrants, so first generation Americans as well. We interviewed folks all over the country from 17 states, uh, all eight regions of the country, so there's good geographic diversity. Um, all 200 families were parents in heterosexual marriages. Most of them married about 20 <coughs> years. Mostly they were middle-aged folks, although there was a range. Wide range of socioeconomic statuses, and the youth tended to be middle, uh, middle adolescents. We asked a number of questions, about 20 questions, about marriage and the ways that uh, people <coughs> felt that their faith, that their beliefs, their practices, their faith communities impacted their marriage. And then in about a quarter of the families, we also interviewed adolescents and interviewed those parents and adolescents together, and I did all those interviews, and it was a blast to interview um, highly religious families with their teenagers and talk to them about how their faith impacted their, their family and their individual lives. In the project, we focus on four main areas, uh, religion and marriage, religion and parent-child relationships, religious identity and spiritual development in youth, and family religious processes. In the interest of time, which I have very little, uh, wow, very little, uh, I'll just mention a few of these. So religion and marriage. Um, I'm just going to summarize in one sentence a few articles. Uh, again, if you're interested, you can email me. I'll send you these slides, then you can, you can click on the, on the link for the article. Um, in, in an article that we just recently published, uh, found that belief in God as a transcendent moral authority helps married couples strengthen their relational bonds. And in other ways, there are some qualitative differences from those who look to God as their authority as opposed to those who were good people and loved each other but didn't have that sort of um, God, uh, that willingness to sacrifice and change uh, for the other person because of one's belief in God. Uh, we studied how religious belief and practice help married couples make significant changes in their marriage. Uh, everyone that's been married for a while knows that you quickly get into patterns and habits. Some of them not good and they're not always easy to change. Religion has a variety of mechanisms that helps couples make important changes in their marriage. So how, different, well, how different people uh, look at God, how they relate to God, has an interesting impact on their marriage. We found a number of different patterns that we, we discussed in, uh, in, in this article. 
We found that for religious couples, uh, their marriage means a great deal to them. And uh, basically, they talked about how their marriage uh, was more than anything else. And, and it, it, because of their religious beliefs, um, it allowed them to center on those things that really matter and, and elevate the, the importance of their marriage, even though um, in many cases they were facing, and in fact, most of the people we interviewed said they were facing the very kinds of problems everyone else around them were facing, but they felt, felt that their faith made a big difference for them. I want to, uh, in a very brief way, um, go into a little bit more detail on one of the articles. I'll actually do this for one other one as well, if we have time, um, on uh, giving you a chance to hear the voices of some of those folks that we interviewed. So this is an article on uh, religion and marital conflict. We found that religion impacts marital conflict uh, at three major stages. It, uh, religious, shared religious beliefs help couples avoid a lot of marital problems that they saw in, in people around them. Uh, once conflict was occurring, religious practice, particularly prayer, tended to make a big difference for people, but attending services, a lot of people described uh, times when they were in the midst of marital conflict and hearing a sermon or a, a lesson or a hymn or a prayer or something uh, made a difference and helped them to resolve the conflict. And then after active conflict is over, reconciling, you know, repairing the marriage, uh, the relationship after the conflict, uh, religion was very helpful, in particular uh, forgiveness uh, and their commitment to permanence. A couple of quotes. Uh, Debbie, about the social worker, said, I think the more shared perspective on life you have, the less inherent conflicts to begin with. So I think having a shared faith is important in that sense, in both the big picture and hopefully in the smaller picture. But I think for me, somehow, my faith affects how I view conflict. Uh, Alex, a Puerto Rican Pentecostal police officer, uh, speaking about how practices help them in conflict resolution, said, a crisis would come. We feel that we need to pray together. We feel that there's a lack of communication between us. As a matter of fact, that happened recently. So we pray together. When we feel that something's trying to divide, we pray together, and it strengthens, or at least alleviates the problem. And about reconciling after conflict, uh, Sean, a Baptist University chaplain, said, because we receive grace and forgiveness from God, we can extend that to each other. We also draw upon him as our resource to be able to live together in a loving, gracious way. Uh, one of my most enjoyable uh, quotes is from an interview with a Catholic father, uh, husband. When I asked how his faith made a difference in his marriage, he said, well, remembering that my wife's ten brothers were there in the church as I spoke my marriage vows has really helped me stay faith. <laughs> so God and ten brothers have helped me. <laughs> All right, a little bit about youth, religious identity, and spiritual development. Found that religious youth uh, described how they explored their religious identity in a variety of ways that led to varying degrees of commitment in their faith. And by the way, the reason I'm going to just give you a couple more quotes is so you get the sense that if you go to our website and read our papers, you won't be reading statistics. You'll be reading mostly quotes from people. So, and there, we were uh, able to interview a lot of great folks who shared a lot of really powerful insights with us. A religious youth describe how their religious commitments are anchored in God, their parents, youth leaders, and peers. This is one of those of you that work with youth in churches uh, who might want to look at. Um, youth describe the variety of ways that different people in their lives made a difference in anchoring their faith commitments. So talk a little bit more about uh, one project, uh, giving up something good for something better, sacred sacrifices made by religious youth. Uh, religious youth made a lot of sacrifices, and, and a variety of uh, those were similar in nature uh, across various faiths, and then some, of course, were, were distinct to, to uh, each faith. One of my favorite articles to hear uh, young people talk about how significant their faith was in their life, how deep their commitment was. It often surprised their parents. Often when these youth would get talking, uh, their parents would sort of look at each other, and their parents would tear up because they, they maybe not, hadn't heard their youth express how deeply they love God and how committed they were to Him and to His faith. So i uh, share a little with you about uh, parent-child conversations. We asked uh, all the families, uh, well, the families that we interviewed the youth in, what, uh, we had a list of 20 religious activities uh, called the Faith Scale, a variety of kinds of things that families do in their home of a religious nature, praying together, reading scripture together, watching religious videos, listening to religious music, and so forth. Um, of all those 20 things, one of them listed was have religious conversations. And that conversations item was the second most frequently mentioned by parents 
uh, after uh, saying grace at meals, and it was the most meaningful activity. And what we found is that there's a variety of ways that parents and children t uh, and youth talk together. The question I asked was, so when you guys talk about religious things, how does that go? To, to tell me how, that, you know, how those conversations go. <coughs> we analyzed uh, all those interviews, all that really interesting data. We found that there were two main kinds of conversations, what we call youth-centered conversations and what we call parent-centered. And the youth-centered conversations were when the adolescent talked more and the parents listened, adolescents sought uh, <coughs> meaning from the parents, uh, religion was related to the adolescent's life, the conversation was open, it might go to other things besides religion, and the parent-adolescent relationship was nurtured. As opposed to parent-centered, where the parent talked too much, the parent gave uh, demands, the parent uh, gave unsolicited uh, talk about religion, and the talk was too restrictive. It only centered on religious things, and if the kid wanted to shift the ground to some other you know, topic, uh, maybe a cool YouTube video they just saw, the parents said, no, 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 we're talking about religion, let's get back to talking about you know, what I want to talk about, which is what you should believe, which is what I believe, so let's get back to that. A few quotes. Uh, Chad, a 12-year-old Episcopalian boy, says, sometimes I ask a question, they think, I think they go too far, and they start talking too much, and I say, I don't want to discuss anymore, I try to walk away, and they have me come back in, and I'm like, really mad. <laughs> Rachel, a Hasidic Jewish mother, we find the older kids get, they have so much to say, they come home, they don't want to hear us talk, they want to talk. Here, a Lutheran mother, I've learned that less words are better because sometimes if you just plant the seed, their mind will work on it. Haley, a 14-year-old LDS girl, talking about her father, who happened to be a seminary teacher. He always, for every situation, even for something like a math problem, he can write a scriptural person like that, get really annoying. <laughs> As she's talking, the mom is nodding, and the dad's... <laughs> Uh, Mandy, if you're a Christian, talking about uh, asking for uh, understanding from parents. They're always willing to talk to me about any question I have. They explain what they believe to me. So the core concept is when parent adolescent religious conversations are youth centered, the emotional experience is more positive for parents and adolescent, adolescents than when they are parents. And both the parents and the adolescents agree with that. So, where are we head? Well, thus far, we've mainly been involved in trying to understand successful American family faith. These folks have been married, uh, in most cases, 20 years or more. Um, they were relatively happy, healthy folks, and so we tried to understand what were the ways that they used their faith to strengthen their American family. <coughs> and now we want to move forward and um, try to inspire and empower the rising generation to create high quality families of faith. So we'll be writing some books based on these data. We, we wanted to do the, you know, the first decade or so uh, get peer review from our colleagues most of our scholarly colleagues uh, in the journals that we publish are not religious. They're skeptical of religion in many cases. Often they're hostile. Um, and so if our stuff gets published in those journals, then it must be basically sound harsh. And now we feel comfortable going to the general public with what we found. So we'll create uh, information on our web page as well as, as Rice and Books. So that's the American Families of Faith Project. I hope you'll take a look at our website. Again, americanfamiliesoffaith.byu.edu. Thank you very much. Laura is going to speak to us 
about fractured fairy tales, helping young people reach their aspirations for marriage and family. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And I would like to begin with the cameras. It should come on. It sometimes it takes a minute. You may need to go find one of the AV guys, the audio visual guys. Yes, the magician. Well, now we don't have no signal. It's coming. You can stop her. <laughs> Life is good when the AV works. <laughs> well, this is a thrill for me to be here with you and with my former professor, Dr. Donna, and with Silvio, whom I met in Sydney in 2013, and he's doing wonderful work in Italy. So it's a great honor for me to be here. I just finished my degree two years ago in family studies, and I took Dr. Dalahite's Family and World Religions class and enjoyed it very much. And so it's kind of like a full circle moment to sit on a panel with your professor. How cool is that? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my name is Laura Bunker, and I am the president of United Families International. Um, we are a public charity NGO that lobbies for family values at the United Nations and state legislatures. And we've been doing so since 1978. And one of my favorite parts about it is that we have academic interns, college-age interns, from several universities join us at the UN and state legislatures to learn how to be an effective advocate for family values. And because of this experience, and one of those is here with us today. Christina, you want to stand up and just wave? Sure. Christina is one of our wonderful interns, and she made a difference at the Utah State Legislature in last session. And come talk to me afterwards about it, and I'll tell you about it. <laughs> um, because of working with these young people, and I have two children in the same age bracket, I love these young people. I would do anything for them, anything to help them be successful. So uh, my subject today is Fractured Fairy Tales. Helping young people reach their aspirations for marriage and family. When I was growing up, I loved to watch Saturday morning cartoons, and one of my favorites was Fractured Fairy Tales. <laughs> and um, they were stories with a satirical twist and morals that didn't make sense. But I love them. So I'll give you an example of a fractured fairy tale, but you'll have to listen very carefully. Rindersella. Rindersella was a beautiful pearl who lived with her muggly other and her two sad blisters. <laughs> One day, her fairy fawn mother appeared in a lightning flash of light and gave Rindersella a dritty press and two silicate drippers for her feet. So Rindersella went to the Bansy Fall and danced with the prance on hints. But when she ran down the stairs, she slopped one of her drippers. <laughs> Unfortunately, the silicate dripper ended up fitting one of Rindersella's two sad blisters, who married the Pransom Hints, who then lived unhappily ever after. <laughs> so, the moral of the story is, if you go to a fancy fall and loll and fub with a Pransom Hints, don't slop your dripper. <laughs> so that's a fractured fairy tale. Young people today live in a world of fractured fairy tales. They are bombarded by satirical twists and morals that don't make sense. Many of them have never even seen the happy ending. The remarkable thing is, that despite this, overall, they still have great hopes for marriage and family. Research shows that 83% of young adults think that it is important to be married someday, and 86% expect their marriages to last a lifetime. Even most high school seniors, 82% of girls and 70% of boys, say having a good marriage is extremely important to them. 
unfortunately, they don't always know how to make that happen. They're not getting the family-oriented cultural cues that previous generations received. They don't know, society tell, or scholars tell us that today's young people struggle in a culture that no longer tells them how sex, marriage, and childbearing should be sequenced. In other words, they don't understand the sequence of success. The sequence of success is very simple. First, finish high school, or better yet, go to college. Second, wait until your 20s to marry, not in your teens. And third, have children after you marry, not before. Doing those three things in that sequence gives them an 82% chance of never living in poverty. That's awesome. It also makes them two to three times less likely to experience divorce. Now that sounds more like the happy ending, but it's hard for them to write their story of success in a fractured world that keeps handing them the wrong script. So what can we do to help them? There are three practical things that we can do to help young people reach their aspirations for a successful family and a successful life. Number one, model a healthy marriage. As we have heard today, you'll hear some similar things repeated again today. And I'm so grateful because this means it really works if you hear it from several witnesses. Now, it's no secret that children learn from imitation, but a recent Yale study showed that children actually learn by over-imitation. So what does that mean? The authors noticed that children follow the adult's steps so faithfully that they let go, they change their mind about what they originally thought. And they would rather do it the way they saw the adult do it than the way they thought it would work. So what is the study's conclusion? Quote, watching an adult do something wrong can make it much harder for kids to do it right. Wow, breakthrough <laughs> study. <laughs> but it is good, it's good to know that it can be verified. So we see this in how often divorce begets divorce. Sociologists have found that divorce increases a child's chance of becoming divorced later in life by 50%. And if that child marries another child of divorce, their chances for divorcing increase by 200%. No wonders we've had a million children since 1970 see their, their parents divorce. A million children every year. Today's young people need to see what a healthy marriage looks like. We've had a few young women living in our home with us, with our daughters. And I was surprised when one of them came into the kitchen and told me right out of the blue, I want a marriage like yours. I, everybody in my family has been uh, divorced several times. I've never seen a marriage last as long as yours. Now this just took me back because I knew and she knew that our marriage was not perfect, but to her it was good enough. Maybe your marriage is good enough too. I love what marriage expert Maggie Gallagher said. She said, we don't talk enough about the power of an average good enough marriage. It doesn't have to be perfect to be powerful. Now remember, marriage is a living thing, and like all living things, some days are better than others. But studies show that two out of three unhappily married adults who hang on without getting divorced say their marriage is happy five years later. So take heart. Hold on to your promises. Hold on to your spouse's hand. Model a healthy <coughs> marriage. And show young people that happy endings usually come one day at a time. 
Number three, practice your religion. As we've heard today, religious observance strengthens families in almost every measurable way. Studies show that couples who attend church together and pray together have better quality relationships. And also, the primary reason why teenagers say that they do not have sex is because it is against their morals or religion. So one clear example of the impact of religious observance in young people can be seen by comparing abortion ratios in the state of Utah. An abortion ratio is the number of abortions per thousand live births. Summit County way up here has, uh, is probably the least religious of the, of the counties within Utah. And their abortion ratio is 143.5. So in other words, for every thousand babies born in Summit County, there are 143 abortions performed. Salt Lake County, which has more religious adherents than Summit County, has an abortion ratio of 100.6. And let's compare those to Utah County, which was ranked as the most religious metro area in the United States, with 77% frequent church attendance, has an abortion ratio of 22.9. So religious beliefs and practices really do have an impact on young people and families. But, as we've also heard today, families also perpetuate religious beliefs and practices. It goes both ways. So maybe that's the take home message for today. Author Mary Eberstadt says, family and religion are the double helix of society each dependent on the strength of the other for successful reproduction. Where there is a breakdown of the family, religious observance also declines. Family and religion need each other to reproduce. I love how she said that. So it's interesting to realize that practicing your religion yourself will not only strengthen your children, but it will perpetuate the very religious beliefs and practices that will strengthen their children. So number three, retell your family stories. Family stories are more than just entertainment. They are a powerful lifeline for the younger generation. Doctors Marshall Duke and Robin Fibish worked with children who were impacted by the trauma of September 11th. And they found that the ones who knew more about their families were more resilient. In fact, the more that children knew about their families' histories, the stronger their, self, their sense of self-control over their lives, and the higher their self-esteem. These are wonderful benefits. And the good news is, the stories don't even have to be trouble-free. You can tell the bad news, too. <laughs> For example, your grandfather was a pillar of the community, but he had a house burned down. But they were able to rebuild. No matter what happened, our family has always stuck together. Typical family story. And the authors included with this powerful, concluded with this powerful advice. If you want a happier family, retell your family's best moments and how they bounced back from the hard ones. That act alone may increase the odds that your family will thrive for generations to come. That's so cool. Okay, we kind of presented this idea at the United Nations and several people came up afterwards and said, what if your family's stories have bad things in them? Like, I don't want to remember my family stories. So what happens if your family stories have alcoholism or abuse or other bad things in them? What do you do? You can be a transitional character in your family and write a new story. A transitional character is someone who changes the course of a family's history in one generation. They say, no matter what has happened in my family before me, it stops with me. 
I will be different. I choose success. One such transitional character was my grandmother, Mary Bannister. She was born in England, but faced some very big problems there, and she decided to move to immigrate to America to start a better life. Although she was young, she was only 19 when she came across on a big boat all by herself. She was alone and she was hard of hearing all of her life. She was brave. She followed the sequence of success. She met and married my grandpa and they survived the Great Depression by renting fixer-upper homes and taking in Mindy. Mary raised five children and now over 200 descendants know that they could do hard things. Because if she could do that, I can do this. There now, I've just told you one of my family stories. <laughs> Doesn't it give you hope? You can give that same hope to your children and your loved ones by retelling your family stories to them. So in conclusion, most millennials do want a happy marriage, a happy family, but many do not know how to, how to achieve it because society is twisting the plot. Let's help our young people achieve their aspirations by modeling a healthy marriage, practicing our religious beliefs, and retelling our family stories. Doing these three things can help young people navigate a world of fractured families and fractured dreams and write their own story along the sequence of success, which is, after all, the best script for true love and happiness, <coughs> or beginning.